been doing this thing. I'm doing uh, haikus of movies, uh, mainly because I was uh, unreasonably proud of the word uh, haiku review. Hashtag haiku review. Um, <laughs> since this is Girls on Key, I'm only doing films here that pass the Bechdel test. We all, <laughs> we all know the Bechdel test. Oh, tell us what the Bechdel test is. What? You want me to mansplain it? I'm, I'll mansplain it in 17 syllables. Too much to ask that two named women talk about something more than men. That's the Bechdel test. So, uh, spoilers from here on out. Um, this is the haiku review of um, Star Wars 7. Ray of light awakes while Kylo, rent by ego, busy mansplaining. Uh, I've done I've done Kill Bill one and two in one haiku. I'm rhyming again. I just can't stop. Uh, sassy assassin, heart exploding for revenge. Five steps lead to the end. I noticed nobody clicked. That's fine because I haven't introduced clicking yet. If you're a... <laughs> I won't take that personally, I just haven't told you to do it. If you're really feeling what a poet's saying, you can give them a click. If you're not a clicking audience, that's fine. Some audiences aren't clicking audience. There's another option what you can do, which is very Melbourne. Hmm. Can we try a hmm? Hmm. Yeah, all right. Okay, let's crash on. Um, we're going to welcome now the uh, the bravest poet in the room, the sacrificial poet. Would you please welcome? Start the round of applause at the back there. Keep it going towards the front. We please welcome our sacrificial poet, Sharifa. But then I decided to not take her down because I'm nice like that. But it's still a takedown of something. It's called To the Flame That Still Burns. White feminism. A movement of frontline runners saving those poor coloured, those poor religious, those poor non white, non Anglo Saxon women from themselves. Remember that you too have a history that was stepped on by white men. You just happen to be by their side when they lit this fire. Your skin. The much they used to ignite this reverse racism. Your dreadlocked hair, the reason it can burn so far, let's forget appropriation. Let's call it admiration. Reverse assimilation. Like, isn't imitation just another form of flattery? Like, isn't John Starsberg's blackface another contribution to the colored community? Like, isn't introducing headscarves into mainstream fashion calling it the latest trend? another form of inclusion. Like how can so many women do so much good but still have a problem with the subtle colors of the past their skin represents when any part of it is dark? Like, sorry. Like maybe these stones still stand. Like maybe Stonehenge still stands. Like maybe Buckingham Palace still stands. Like maybe the Eiffel Tower still stands because your people send my people love on the edges of rockets. Call it revenge. And then ask us why we're so angry when we call you out on your white privilege. Like maybe it's out of line for someone like me to call you out on your white privilege. Like not all white people are oppressive and supremacists. But y'all don't exactly say no when all the opportunities are handed to your children. When social apartheid places you on the wider, more privileged, more well-maintained, more wealthy side of the white picket fence. And leaves my people scaling the walls that separate us with nothing but the sacrifices our parents hand us. Because when you're born into an ethnic migrant family, Nobody tells you to carry on the legacy of your forefathers. They're too busy trying to stay afloat. Your blood isn't a metaphor in a series. Your blood isn't a metaphor in a series of well choreographed words. You're still perfecting your English to scrub at the way it stains your history. Like maybe the reason we yell so loud is because we're trying to get through all this white noise. <laughs> Oh, okay. 
Okay. Forget the patriarchy. Women like me were born to fight for a different kind of accountability. So maybe this fire still burns. See, your skin is the match you use to ignite this reverse racism, your turbaned hair, the appropriation you use to keep you warm, and these cinders bloodstains the reason you forget to check your white feminism. That's it. Um, so the second one is a change of pace. It's something you that I've been doing. Um, it's called total involvement. A dental student's worst nightmare is what we like to call total involvement. It's when a cavity runs so deep that excavating it would ultimately result in the extraction of that tooth. My heart is the tooth. You are the cavity. <laughs> but I miss you. Sometimes I want to tear it out, but I miss you. On days like this when I can feel closure on the tip of my tongue, but I still can't taste it. Like, I'm done listening to Taylor Swift. <laughs> but I'm still playing a double on this, like... When the rain is blowing in your face, and the whole world is on your case. I'll love for you a warm embrace to make you feel my love. And I'm kind of sick of people telling me that nothing's real but love. And if this love was actually real, it would have surpassed everything to make sure that I made you feel it. Because, yeah, love can surpass some things. Love can surpass children. Love can surpass mortgages, taxes, dodgy accountants. Love can surpass domestic arguments. But love doesn't dare, dare stand in the way of war, won't even attempt to wash away the bloodstains you still see on your hands, won't drag the bodies out of your nightmares. Love won't let these hands fix, hands fix you. They fix so many things, but love won't even drain the sea to let them reach you, and love will not bring us home. In Arabic, we say that Ois only found Leila after she died of a broken heart. And I didn't know what that meant until I found myself stopping my hand from reaching inward. On days like this, when I can feel closure on the tip of my tongue, but I still can't taste it. Because you're eating away at my heart and I'm not attempting to excavate. Because I'm still glad that I can miss you. Thanks. Hey. Every time I see Sharifa, she, she hits me with something, she really does. Um, so it's always a pleasure, always a pleasure to see her down here and anywhere she's performing. We ready to get into the open mic? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. The time is right. When I say the time is right, you say open mic. The time is right. Open mic! The time is right. Open mic! Okay, I'm not going to get any better than that. Uh, please welcome the first reader on the open mic is Rania. that was carved from stone and wood and it was very artistic, it was her favourite thing except it actually blocked half the driveway so whoever came out kind of got a little dimp in their car so now that she is no longer with us I'm writing this about the mailbox It stands up head high deep in her front yard, or what used to be hers. I remember how she caressed it like a baby as it brought daily gifts. Comforted by its texture, pressing down dents in her skin. How she would frown when it was cursed for being in the way of cars. And her smile as she defended her precious. 
how she would wave from the doorway to make sure no harm had befallen her piece of art. Animosity grew between it and I. When I saw scratches on my new beloved ride. But for her, for her I smiled. For her I loved, for her I hid. Now she's gone forever. All I want to do is hug you and cry. Maybe, maybe it will feel like I hugged her. For you are all that is left. As your chiseled, rocky-like waves imprint my rosy mud, we recreate memory. A memory which says we once we once were loved. Thank you. Um, this next one is for the poetry scene. I have to dedicate it to. Um, yeah, so all the poets that have welcomed me, um, the weird one, yeah. <laughs> it's called To You. You see me. How is it that you see beyond ghost life's transparency? When for many years I was certain invisibility was my destined path. I am but a shadow of a dream, wishing to one day be a reality. I am a cycle of inquisition caught within your glance. How does one fluoresce amidst bright radiance, except via eyes which see beyond what is? Thank you. Beautiful stuff. Give it up, please. Fantastically open. It's okay to be vulnerable up here. It's okay. We're all friends. <laughs> Would you please welcome, start the round of applause at the back of the room. Woo! Right now, a second reader on the open mic is Edward. <laughs> Girls on key regular. Get out here, man. Impulse reciprocating a past moment, an imagination with no price tag or third party insurance bonus, an appreciation of time and an ability to just be, an idea of love that can be encouraged through abstinence and the ability to share, awareness of positive sacrifices in the way it benefits self empowerment, and a healthier way to communicate. I like the consequences of the actions I haven't made yet and can't wait to participate with the people I'm lucky enough to encounter. Thank you. For something genuine in a moment that matters that is an amazing thing. The idea that every moment matters and right and wrong is the illusion of our moral conscience, all a matter of perspective and our ability to accept ourselves. I hope everyone's having a good day. <laughs> um, a shadow of an impression suppressed through intense imagination. A life lived through daring myself and my ability to affect something small in the world of seven billion. The, world, the worth of which is the shadow of the image stuck in people's imaginations. Who, why, how could someone possibly? Brought up to breed and always oppose. The insanity of habit and the understanding that success encourages imitation of people who don't know why. Substance removed and the identity reinforced by a hierarchy and its inability to be open-minded. Sheltered through obedience and labeling the unknown. This I don't understand. This I can't comprehend. This does not define me. I am simply I am. Mm -hmm. If we really are the universe experiencing itself, experiencing itself subjectively, then everything matters and we're doing what's meant to be. Accepting we're all animals and we don't know the truth, an archaic image of creation eluding disputes. Can we all agree that we're just one idea? We all live on this planet that I hold dear. 
Amazing wonders I stand bewildered, frightened of the time when I heard what he did. Imagination spoiled and temptations turned rotten, when the ultimate gift is nature and inlet oxygen. To exist in this moment with the ability to breathe is life's biggest gift that we've already achieved. Any moment will last if we believe in an idea, a future believing, communicating to peers, break all the walls that divide an economic state. I promise in my opinion it's not too late. Give it up for Fantastic stuff. Fantastic stuff. We're just reality experiencing itself subjectively. <laughs> <laughs> Would you welcome on stage the third open mic reader, regular, regular uh, reader on the Melbourne poetry scene? It's Ezra. <laughs> See, once upon a time, there was a perfect little puzzle with a pretty picture proud in his chest. His, his perfect puzzle pieces and pretty puzzle print were loved deeply by the people that mattered, and despite the scattered obstacle, this puzzle tried his best. But the perfect little puzzle had a few pieces missing and doubts. He liked to praise his empty spaces for what pictures they could make when he finally felt to fill them out, but sometimes the perfect little puzzle was puzzled. He saw other puzzles with all their pieces in place, so many pieces that these puzzles thought to tell the perfect little puzzle that he should replace his space with their spare picture parts. Told him he should fill in the cracks of his broken heart with the extra pieces they cut around and the perfect little puzzle looked down at his patchwork print all paisley and lint and wondered why they thought him broken. Even so, he found that none of the spare pieces fit that maybe if he pushed them down, wiggled them around, or took out a few of his own pieces, they would. But the pictures that created were not perfect. So the perfect little puzzle grew sad. Thought he had to find his missing pieces, and one day, while he was searching, he found another little puzzle with a few missing pieces. And doubts. A puzzle with smarts who smiled and offered him no spare parts. No offers to mend a heart he had never really wanted to call broken, and the perfect little puzzle with the pretty picture did not cry. He just took off the scarf he had started wearing to hide the parts of him that were not yet complete, and the puzzle he found was astounded by what they saw. Brought him real close and told him, you never have to be complete, but if you ever want to keep looking, we can look together. And it's better that way. Now the perfect little puzzle with the picture proud on his chest tries his best. He would never try to hide again. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I wrote this other thing. Because uh, I started doing prompts in public transport to kind of make uh, public transport less tedious. Um, How is that? <laughs> well, I mean like it's still tedious, but at least I get poems out of the tedium. Anyway. Um, shit, let me see if I can find it. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so the prompt I got was from a good friend of mine, and yeah, the prompt was a lost bicycle, and I don't know if it makes sense without the context, but there you <laughs> When we met, you set me with loving eyes and promised we'd run away together. Nothing but dusty track and a little bit of rust, because I wasn't exactly new when I found you. We were the child on a wild journey to nowhere on a path only we could see. Because the kind of eyes you need for that would be the wanna-see-it kind of eyes, the open-to-surprise kind of eyes that can see where the end of the rainbow lies and doesn't waste time running when there's a riding to be done. But now I'm leaning against a pole in a park, stark weather and there's more rust. The dust is wet now and I'm upset. Because when we wished upon our style, you promised to always kiss me between my handlebars, or at least that's what I thought. And maybe we were born to ride into the sunset, or maybe I misspoke. Give it up for Ezra, please. Come on. Buy him a drink, but don't buy him more than one because he can't handle bars. <laughs>
fair enough. This is all, this is all, you know, this is all up for grabs. <laughs> Would you please welcome now, um, the energy she has brought to the modern poetry scene is impossible to overstate. She won't like me saying this, but it is. Um, she's got a book out, um, I, it's not available here, is it? No? No, it's available online. You know that internet they have now? You can get it on that internet they have now. Uh, on the World Wide, uh, the World Wide Web's there. Um, would you please welcome Sam Ferranto. Dance to the beat of your own drum. But is any song really yours? We've been listening to music since train whistles and fire department horns blared their way through the taut stretched skins of our mama's belly buttons. Since proud grandmothers first tapped and stroked those bellies with wonder and smiled nostalgia. Since water fell over the crowns of our heads in our first bath and the drops arranged them sh themselves into sheet music we couldn't read yet. Since we shakily raised our heads like seals up off carpeted floors to follow the heavy, loud thumps of all of these smiling, giant people walking in syncopation to our tiny heartbeats. Since the bus rolled up and all of those big kids beat their fists against belt buckles, green and brown leather seats, metal superhero lunch boxes, since the first scratching of chalk on a blackboard, stick-drawn battle plans on the playground, nails against half-grown desks. No wonder our first steps are shaky, our heads swiveling dangerously in all directions. This is a complex symphony, and the maestro is never well lit. So trust the orchestra. Move your feet, don't miss your cues. Take the solo and provide a steady pulse only when you're sure you've found that larger song. Dance to the beat of your own drum, but listen, too. Yes. like more shit than new, but it is <laughs> both of those shit. things. First draft. <laughs> it was real bad. I just felt like doing it. I feel like a whiskey. You make me feel dangerous, like I could scream in the middle of a tram or sing dirty lyrics at the office. You feel like the first time two boys, men really, to my 14-year-old self, grabbed my calves and pushed me on top of a crowd and toward a line of amps. You feel like licking the rim of a bottle of Jack. I drink Jameson now. You feel like standing on tiptoes, looking down and realizing that five foot seven is actually quite high up. You feel like high heels students always expect to be a teacher. You feel like bodycon dresses and the first pull on a cigarette with hollow cheeks over a turned up collar. You feel like the phantom vibration in my back pocket that I don't check anymore. You feel like too good to be true, so fuck it. I'll enjoy it before it burns. You feel like chilled glass on a bottom lip and whiskey touching the cracks of a top lip. You feel like the first time I heard Sunday candy and you gotta move slowly. And closing my eyes to lying is the most fun a girl can have without taking her clothes off. Is it still me who makes you sweat? You feel like an eight second video, a snap that we both know you took three versions of. An intentional pause in conversation, changing the emoticon, a gift war, far away. You feel far away, and I feel dangerous. You feel like painting my nails, snicking a lighter, poetry. I hate that you feel like poetry, that's mine. Don't take that too. You feel like give and take and give and take and give. What do you feel like? I can't write any more of you. I have a story too. This is mine. Don't take that too. Thank oh. <laughs> you, ladies and gentlemen. The book is called Pick Me Up. You can uh, pick it up online. Uh, I have two copies here and I'm really broke. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Go and see Sam, buy a copy. I bought a copy, it's fucking fantastic. You can get her to sign it. Um, there was a reference to, uh, to crowd surfing there. So, um, oh, no. No, no, no. No, do it. What? <laughs> what? Do it, do it, do it. No, it's not going to work, is it? It's not going to work. It's not going to work. All right. Okay. That's the one you want. Would you please welcome next on the open mic the uh, current Slama Lama champion, the current, the current hugging champion. Ladies and gentlemen, you all know him. It's Mr. John Iglesias. a really rare evening where you know both features and you're excited yes. <laughs> because it's not I'm as it's like I'll go support me. one I'll be kind of surprised by the other and whatever but I know both of you it's so cool um, so this is a piece about addressing doubt um, amongst performers particular, particularly people who wonder about their own voice um, this is a piece called I was there There will come a time when your words will leap with ease from the tip of your tongue. No doubt you have seen them, those performers who sweep with effortless grace like the highest eagle in flight, but don't you just love it when someone brings something new? I mean, you can see it when it's new, and it's such a privilege to see the tremor in hand, the checking of spot on page, the squinting and holding to the light like deciphering treasure maps with invisible ink, wisdom which has been etched down, crossed out, scratched down again by firelight, by phone light in the magic hours and crazy hours of night. This is the exciting stuff. It's fresh, and it's rough, and it's still finding its feet. There's a breath and a pause before the plunge. There is a leap that happens into a world beyond our control. It's terrifying and it is exhilarating. The wondering how high you might fly or how hard you might fall. That anything could happen out there and, and, and anything is out there. Anything could happen and you go beyond what you have known when you share something new. Now, I've seen rappers rip pages from their spine spit and spin stories and throw them away like the shedding of skin. I've watched nervous comedians with trembling hand and trembling voice wishing to stretch out and test their speed, still bound to the palm cards and the scrolled observations and notes in napkins racing against time and gravity as the mic stand slowly sinks. <laughs> I've watched grown men blush like young boys declaring love or scowling and yelling prophecy through seething teeth. Paper wrinkling in clenched fist grip, then cast down like exercise demons, then lovingly gathered back up and jammed back into vest pockets and side pockets. <laughs> I've seen victims claim their victory here, speak words with more power than any page could hold down, or any cage could hold in, taking the scrunched pages stored up within them, flattening them out and putting something new on them. Hearts and journals open, thumb lick, each page edge kissed, drawn out and dropped, tears cascading, leaves falling in autumn, the marking of seasons ending, and new days emerging, the rediscovery of voice and of wings still yet to be used. We all have baby feathers in there somewhere. That part within us still shedding, still growing, still molting, not knowing the world of earth and sky beyond this safe nest of knowing, a young lady once said to me, I always thought about writing poetry, but someone else has probably already written about it and probably done it better, so why should I bother? And I said to her, every note on the piano has already been played. Oh. And yet we still play. So I want to hear the notes and the way you'd play them. I want to hear the words and the way you'd say them. Don't think that someone else's voice disqualifies you from having your own. Don't you know? You are not made to stay silent. You were born with a deep breath and a loud cry. God created you to be heard. So be heard. We are not your competition. 
We are your audience. We are not the judges of your doom. Rather, we are the witnesses to your glory. What tectonic plates will shift in minds because you took one single step? What fissures shall cause these veins of gold to rise from deep within this hardened earth? You don't know what the world will be like the moment after this. That's okay. Neither do we. We stand on the edge of anticipation with you. The world is waiting with bated breath to see where you will go, so may you step out from what you have known and take the leap of faith into the unknown. There will come a time when your words will leap with ease from the tip of your tongue, but till then, I wish you the edge of the nest. Racing heart, blushing cheeks, sweaty palms, trembling hands, trembling voice, fleshly, freshly drying ink, fluster and flurry, I wish you stage fright, but then the confidence to overcome it. To step out from a world being before you and into a world being for you. May you move from being held to being carried. We delight in seeing your wings molt before our eyes. I would proudly gather your feathers and store them close to my heart so that I can say that I was there. Yes, yes, I was there when your voice took the air and your words soared. Thank you. Give it up to John. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Always an incredible intro. Only 24 hours in a day. Only 12 minutes that a man can play. But we all play him differently and we all we all beat to the sound of our own drum. Oh, yeah. She said that earlier, I see. Yeah, that was. Yeah, it's a reference. Okay, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna have a we're going to have a short five minute break now. Um, I'd encourage you to go to the bar, support the venue that supports poetry, buy a drink, buy a crepe, buy a poetry drink. And buy raffle tickets. Buy a raffle Ooh. ticket. We're, this is um, alchemy this evening. We're turning, we're turning words into feelings and we're turning raffle tickets into prizes. Prizes, prizes, prizes. <laughs> So um, there's three different prizes. We've got Overland, Lifted Brow, and Victorian Writer for Young Adults. They're all amazing publications, amazing poetry. So yeah, the raffle tickets are one for two dollars or three dollars. No, sorry. One for three dollars, two for five. So good bargain. Um, come see me. And the money goes. All of it goes to support the um, Syrian refugee crisis appeal that the Red Cross is putting together. And when we come back, we've got our first feature, Shalice. Get your drink on, get your smoke on, come back for something to think on. are on the ground floor. Please welcome Shalice Van Wingarden. And he looks like an angstier version of Ben 10 without the cool watch. <laughs> I can smell the tension he interprets as romance, and I'm just politely looking for the nearest escape route. Shalice. 
do you love me? At that point, I had no idea what it was to lead someone on. I didn't know that if I let him lend me his t-shirt, he took the last small size. I had sprinkled the same dash of hope onto him that puppies get all the time when kids stop to cuddle them in a pet shop, only to get bored and run to the fish aisle. Now he's looking at me like he's waiting for the word fetch. Tyrone, I see you as a brother. It took him five years to get the hint. Five years of back alleyway roses, poetry texted to my brick phone, and $500 withdrawals he refused to admit were his settling payments. Yeah, like, um, I'm pretty well paid. I'll buy you the whole world if I can one day. But, like, for now, just uh, pick whatever you want, babe, he'd say as we walked into Target. <laughs> All the time I'm thinking, what the fuck have I done to make you fall for me so damn hard? But I kind of liked it. <laughs> it sparked a trend that made me feel powerful, and now I'm standing in a pile of nutshells I discarded after every I love you I didn't have an answer for. Thirteen. Bailey. Fourteen. Paul. Fifteen. Jai. Fifteen. Chapman. Fifteen. Hendrix. Fifteen. Reese. Sixteen. Ashley. Of course the room was half lit. Of course the television was murmuring something foreign and irrelevant. Of course we were lying on the couch, overtired and half asleep. Either way, I didn't expect my first kiss to happen on this night. We came together like water and electricity, and I was the kid mesmerized by the sparks without seeing the danger, so I dove in head first, then heels. It would have been nice if a trumpet or something boomed from the sky, signaling the apocalypse, but seven months into our affair, that familiar text message buzz that was never from her somehow sounded different. Maybe it was my naivety. Maybe she truly did have irresistible charm. Or maybe the gods were just so tired of my ego reaching close to where they lived that they threw me a bone that never left their hand. From lying in a pile of nutshells, I was discarded enough to every I love you I didn't get an answer for. I mean, I should have seen it coming, right? It's like they say, it's physics, like what goes up must fall. And no matter how harmless the firework looks like from where you're standing, that crack will always sh sound like a gunshot to someone else. Mm. Thanks. on the tram on the way here. Look, I hope you won't judge me too much for my clumsy wording, but I saw a man on the next carriage playing violin like it was his lover. He held the bow like a quill, stroking calligraphy onto those strings like he was writing a letter to sound itself, and I just had to tell you. My pen might inscribe with as much precision as his practiced hands, but my first thought when I heard that sound was to record it and keep it safely tucked inside this memory box, because I don't know how many other people know. 
There's an urge to share built into this body, and I tend to do it in the space kind of like this one, but I wasn't given the memo that before I could spill forth a burning, I'd have to earn it through a couple drafts first. Like a poem isn't worth it till it's polished, clean, like uniform shoes covering necessary dirty holes, socks. Is that true? I wrote this on the tram on the way here, so I hope you won't judge me too much for my jaded rambling, but life's a little ready to rumble right now, and if I can't say it to the person I need to, I say it to the crowd, and maybe if I nail my performance enough, they'll forgive me when the show ends. The mic's such a good buffer for that. Perfect to pass off thinly encrypted confessions is art. Maybe it is art. Maybe... Every colour spoken is a splash of paint to the canvas, and our spirits sit somewhere between the cracks of acrylic that dried too quick under the heat of an ever-warming sun. And our spirits, they're holding hands. One says, we should have never painted outside, this nature's made perfection impossible, while another stays silent and notices how the cracks line up with the half-painted landscape streams that disappear into a blank that hasn't even been confessed yet. I wrote this on the tram on the way here, and I hope you don't mind that fact, but I saw a man in the next carriage playing violin like it was his father. I don't think he was rehearsing. He might have had a few concerts behind his back, or maybe he was just a back porch recluse playing to the moon. But he held that bow like a quill, stroking calligraphy onto those strings like he was writing secrets he hasn't told a soul. I just had to tell you about it. Because I don't know how many other people. temper of our eyes? Tell me, is willpower something you gain when you're old and wise? Because my knuckles wrestle with the notches of my ever-coiling spine. See, I've been trying to give my fickle will time, but it's ticking, and I'm wishing I had the courage to apply my knowledge to my wisdom. It's as if we always know what to do, but there's no backup to our convictions, so we evict them. Breaking hearts over mistakes we wouldn't make if we could make a proper choice instead of sleeping them away and taking trouble as it comes. I hear the humming from below. The kind of cry that causes quakes, they call it prison for mistakes. But what if hell is just another heartbreak? Wretches wailing over second circle balconies, begging for their lover to take them back while the flames lick disintegrating railings. Lovers leaning over, losing balance between the quaking and the singing of the dial tone. Dante was jesting when he wrote that sad chime. The woe that is the bitterest is remembering in our wretchedness the unreturning happy times. And may I add, our crime. 
friends. See, if memory was as fleeting as the traitor's kiss on the cheek of Christ, our follies would feel like just another exhale, like the last breath and the next, and we would never need to confess them. We would forget them. See, it's not the acts that send souls to hell, it is the will, or rather, the lack of one. If I could carve another circle into inferno, it would be for spinelessness. For the unfeeling. The ones who take it as it comes, with no compass to guide their eyes from the grey to the black and white. The ones that make excuses, saying it's okay to lie to your lover about what happened yesterday. For the ones that drink bottles dry at the dinner table with their children staring at their lens eyes, thinking it's a fair compromise because the right to get drunk is the only thing you have left to feel like a bachelor again. Because arguing is easier when you can blame it on the alcohol and your children are too young to understand. For the ones who chase the orgasm on a computer screen. Necktie, loose and unzipped jeans late at night while the wife can't see. Magazines stashed under the left side of the bed six feet deep under wedding sheets. Should I turn the light out? Please. If your shoes were on my feet, I wouldn't want to witness my spouse consecrate their cravings with the click of a mouse. Am I not good enough now that sex is cheap? Now we can walk down the aisle and see Sue right next to Dr. Seuss, justifying the fact that it's plastic wrapped as if the cover can't corrupt the eyes of our children, but grab the mad argument. No, slap down the cash and try not to cover your eyes from the guy who sold candy apples to your kids a week ago. How's the wife? He asks with sad eyes. And your mind takes you back to the time where you couldn't help but smile. So but you trigger the happy mask, nod and say, no, she's fine. Bear your chest while you justify your purchase. Just a man watching the menagerie, still adhering to monogamy, but honestly, how different are you now from what you swore you wouldn't be? So we all claim to be free at some point in our lives until we realize we're only as free as our next decision, or our next indecision binding us to the consequences. Chain link to chain link, choking up over the why and the how and what went wrong, wringing our necks in frustration, and the wish that we use the common created to hold our backs together. Use our parents' information. I mean, how many times have we heard our mother told us to stand up straight? Like it was some kind of extended metaphor as if to say, take advantage of your spine instead of slouching like the missing link. As if to say, stand up for what? For yourself. For something. But funny how every time she pulled those shoulders back, that slump again almost instantly. Uh. See, I'm, I'm preaching. Yet I contradict everything that I'm teaching. I tango on heartstrings. And when that phone rings, I shudder with instinct. Fuck, I'm in trouble with the one that I claim to love. Now my being says hide and retreat. So I look at my feet and tap, tap, tap into a beat that's louder than guilty. And when I do, I feel filthy. And it's the same progress. Thinking of another during sex, thinking less of what is right despite my conscience, thinking more of a good night than the consequence, incompetence. Telling myself I have the right to not reply, I'm suddenly blind, suddenly shy, and avoiding the eye. My point of vision is a window to my soul. So how can I face them? Face the fact that the spine keeping structured to my back lies fractured. Sold out to what's easy. My loose decisions incinerate me, or create me, or reduce me to the cracks that flutter out every time these bones encounter pressure after ages of disuse. If I could carve another circle into inferno, it would be for those cracks. For the unused buttons of the phone refusing contacts with the wretches who never got that message back. For the unfeeling ones. For me.
So I have time for another poem? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is totally new shit. New shit? Um, it's not in a better mood, but you guys are going to have to deal with it. That smile was a scoff. You balanced our song on your stomach like you knew your call would be my resting place. That place from which you groaned, that semi breathed resounding through me in a loop I would play over and over. Timidly tracing my fingers across your words like a harp I only knew how to play in one key. There was so much to you. I'd stand at your refined shore. I would dig my toes into your sand and smile, knowing I could never count the drops that made you, let alone hold them. I'd keep my feet bare so I can feel myself slowly sink into you, embrace the back and forth lap of your moods. One minute giggling through a shaking head as if you're in wonder with me. And as I let your world caress my feet, you'd kick me back my boots. How pretentious can you be, you loser? I prefer if you wear shoes. It was easier seeing past the biting insults when you constantly reassured me they didn't carry venom. Like that's what defines a snake. Funny how I still found myself milking it, since calling me a bitch was the most endearing term as far as you're concerned. Are you sure that sting has no virulence, dear? My cheeks still see red when you use that word. When our hands haven't yet met, they dance around each other in shy salute. My necklace, the kerchief nodding unspokens together until they touch. Since tried weaving its strands into a dream catcher as if giving it a new purpose would capture the nightmares. But there wasn't enough rope for the both of us. I didn't ask the sky for much in those days. Just one star to make a single pendant saying, This amulet will outshine those dark contortions and incinerate the monster's tricks. I made myself a maker, a blacksmith of a new world, fashioning raindrops into arrowheads for you. Soil into swords to smite your raven by the horde. I was so original. Last time I saw that amulet, it was rusted at the bottom of your restless sea, among my shipwrecked intentions and that forgotten prose I'd composed in your times of anxiety. I'd ask over your shivering on that shriveled up couch, in the peaching dawn of that old backyard garage, sigh a sigh for me. Conjuring up visions of a world I created for you. Where waves of flavors and tea carried our makeshift raft to safety, it carried you to sleep. After we drained that winter into spring, you'd wake and disintegrate everything. I've never heard romantic used as an accusation like that before. It was like a battle cry commanding your entire army into retreat, and the last thing I caught was a glinting hilt before every sheath ashed from its belt and spilt over the ground my palms were still wet with. I, brave, I played the brave native who knew the workings of your storms the moment after I smelled the rain from the docking ship for the first time. I guess I didn't pay attention in history class. It doesn't work out. I was so ready to offer you my sword at your service, and all you sought was acceptance. For the record, dear, I did not intend to romanticize your mental illness. I should have known. So kick me back my boots. That horizon still got a lot of lessons left to sail. Give it up for Shalice, please. What an amazing set.
One of her pieces uh, reminds me of a stupid poem that I, uh, that I wrote. Um, Before you judge someone, walk a mile in your shoes. That way, when judging you do, you're at a safe distance and you've got their shoes too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're going to have another five minute break. In the break, we're going to be uh, we're going to be shopping raffle tickets. You can turn raffle tickets into amazing books, amazing publications. You're going to support the venue that supports poetry. You're going to buy a drink. You're going to get your drink on. You're going to get your smoke on. We're going to be back for our second feature, Soup G, and we're going to be back for five more on the open mic. Thanks very much. doesn't remember because now she's a, an international touring poetry superstar, but um, Sukjit was emceeing the first time I performed at uh, Slamma Lama Ding Dong, and uh, what she did was uh, a call and response so people would pronounce her name properly. So when I say Suk, you say Jeet. Suk. Jeet. Suk. 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 And uh, I, I followed her up and, and, and tried to do the same thing, and, and, and then I realised my name is only one syllable. So I, 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 I went, when I say Tim, you say, no, that doesn't work. Uh, okay, we're going to welcome now, and as I say, an international superstar. This is Suji. Um, she's a grown woman, hairy, single, and ready to mingle. Uh, a storyteller, you'll find her on park benches, DNMing with strangers about the evils of patriarchy, or impromptu rapping about Tony Abbott with her best mate. She's passionate about performing arts and inherently merges her advocacy background with skills with arts. Uh, while an exchange in Prague, a Bulgarian backpacker hijacks Sukjot's laptop and types in Sarah Kay. Exposing her to the magical word, world, of spoken word. Since then she's been workshopping pieces, only in 2014, that she decided to perform spoken word for a wider audience, spiralling off into a YouTube channel uh, titled Contemporary Cur. Uh, Suki's writing predominantly surrounds stories of the Sikh Disappropria, that's a difficult word for me, uh, diaspora. diaspora, thank you. Yeah, I'm not very bright. Um, uh, family, cultural confusions, and gender. She's still discovering the art form. Would you believe it? Uh, and experimenting with style and concept. Um, she currently resides in the big city of Melbourne, and recently took to the the big stage of Australia's Got Talent. So, uh, do we want to hear from Suk G? Yes. Yeah. Do you want to hear from Suk G? Yeah. Do you want to hear from Suk G? Yeah. Do you want to hear from Suk G? Yeah. Do you want to hear from Suk G? Yeah. It's four yeses. Yes, let's hear it. Let's hear it from Suk G. And he's like, oh, I'm like, you just lost three points, mate. You just lost three points. I'm just gonna take my filter. No, I'm not gonna do that. Um, it's really windy today. So it was like, wind blowing in my eye. You know how I feel. People getting high. You know. How they feel Cars drifting on by You know how we feel It's a Monday On a winter night Here at Open Studio And we're feeling good 
Every time I did this, though, I had like I had a lot of seek crowds when I was overseas. It was very fully Sikh. It was like a fully Sikh tour. It was just like Sikh world. Like I didn't know what country it was. I didn't know what was happening because it was just brown people in my face all the time. And and no, every time I did the hum, everyone thought I was singing like a Hindi, like a Bollywood song. And I was just like, oh, you know. Do you know who me is? Simone is like, no, we don't know what you're talking about. I was like, okay, cool, that's fine. So, I, I actually never do this. I never read other people's work because I'm just, I don't know, I just do, I read my own. But I met a girl, I met a girl in the UK and I really miss her. And she, she and I, it's the first time we, I've done like a, a piece with someone else and we did it together and I decided to do it alone today. Um, but because I missed her, so I decided to do it. And it's really cool. Like, it's, um, I think someone said a line today about how, oh, yes, yes, John. He was like, oh, you know, the piano, and how, you know, sometimes we go, oh, they've already been said, these things have already been talked about, these issues have already been talked about. Well, this stuff you've probably already heard about, but I just, I like the way she's done it. And it's actually based on a, a blog, which she said was from Australia, and it's called Boobs, Bumps, and Blood. I don't know, I've never heard of it, um, but maybe you guys have. Um, and she based it on that, and it's, it's in three sections. So, anyways, let's enjoy it. <laughs> Boobs. Cleavage gleaming because they're allowed for selling car ads. Aftershave, maybe, but for feeding, they seem to be yelling. Disgusted. Make a profit from my parts. Have them bursting at the seams, but a hint of nipple on Instagram seems to be getting screams. Indecent. I won't apologise for my areola if it offends you. I don't need to befriend you or your objectification. Call it disturbing the peace. Call it lewd behaviour. Call it public indecency. But I don't see why a mother should feed her child in secrecy. It's over. We are done agreeing obediently. Bumps. Why do you use the word female as a noun? So all that makes me worthwhile is my description, the adjectives added to me. Conditioned to criticise our creases as if they were diseases, slim and trim this, tight and inside for that, but not too much because you need curves. They want that. They? Since when was my existence made for a man? Oh man, oh man, oh man. Wanna cover me up in makeup? Oh, but not too much because then I'm fake with it. Wait a minute, I wear all that I like or nothing at all. I don't need to paint on my smile to show I'm happy with it all. I learned to love me every inch. Blood. I would sneak my sanitary towels in the house as if they were drugs. What the fuck? I would sneak my sanitary towels into their house as if they were drugs. Babies are expected of me, but my monthly madness is in an open conversation. Keep that behind closed doors or closed legs or cross legs. Rouge on my jeans, my thighs are blushing like my cheeks with the embarrassment. Ashamed of the stains on my covers as if I committed a murder. Scrubbing the evidence in secret, all that we're killing is a young girl's self-worth. As long as they can provide a healthy birth, right? And now I'll serve my time, one week, once a month, a life sentence. Shout out to just three four. Well done. I hope you can hear us. Let's be creative. Let's be creative. Yeah. Am I doing yeah, can you just put it? Sorry. No, uh, it's not that broken. Basically, like, it'll do. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so, you can hear me, can't you? Yeah. You can probably see these cracks as well. But to prove a point, I was sitting there today and I was like, you know what? We're going to do something different. And most people are going to enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. So, I got on TV and I put my hair and legs on TV and everyone was just like, I know you guys might be like, oh, that's, that's normal, that's fine, that's fine. But do you know what's not fine? The fucking Sikh community who like says, is that, is that phone? Is that phone? I'm the Nazi teacher that gets pissed off. But then I have a bunch, of, I'm wearing my 
grand and his father. Um, but then a bunch of sick men, like 200 of them, messing the fuck out of me. And then we can move this out. And, and they say things like, oh, you are not a sink. Oh, you, how dare you parade around and like, I'm going, I'm from Perth. So I've got like haters, like, like, you know, confronting my family at the temple going, oh, I'm so ashamed of your daughter. How dare she do such shame, shame things, naughty, naughty things on TV. I'm like, what? That's not cool. The reason why I put my legs on TV was because people need to seriously get the, confront the shit out of this and be like, you know what? I don't care. I don't care if it's in HD and it's on your fucking plasma. <laughs> you know what? Thanks, mum. I know you're proud of me. I know deep down she's proud of me, but she's like, whoa, why is she, she shrinking her leg on TV? That's all right. But the reason why I'm doing this is because it was cold outside. I couldn't come with my hairy legs out in the boot. So I decided to change in between. Um, so, um, the reason why I'm very tired and I'm not making very good eye contact today is because I am very delirious and I can still hear jet planes in my brain, which is why I can't hear what I sound like. I honestly don't even know and I feel very phlegmy, so just deal with it. Um, I feel like that's been chilly, so I think that's been our like motto, hasn't it? Deal with it, deal with it, deal with it. I love it. Shalise, by the way, you made me feel so many things. I'll let lay you there. Thank you so much. You made me feel. You made me feel. Um, and also, to the, the previous five and then the five that are going to come. Amazing, amazing, can't wait. Um, so, um, this next piece is um, about about being hairy. And I would like you all, um, please get off your phone, sir. Please get off your phone, sir. Please get off your phone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, I want you guys to actually get a little bit intimate with your hairs or a part of your body that you look in the mirror at and you're like, mm, I wish, you know, I wish this was better or this was thinner or this was trimmer or this was fatter or, I don't know. I want you to just get a little bit intimate or if you're feeling like, oh, I'm a bit intimidated by doing that right now, people are going to stare at me and like, oh, my God, the lights. Um, you can imagine, you can imagine you're doing it, but honestly, let's, you know, enjoy whatever hair you have, you know, it could be the we'll stuff, we all have it, okay, just like, we have, yeah, so just enjoy it, because I want you guys to get a little bit intimate with yourselves um, during this piece, I uh, thank you very much, I appreciate it, I watched every bit of that, um, so this next piece um, is inspired by, I was walking down Ligon Street, and I was feeling really chipper, and I was like, walking down, wearing my summer dress, and I was like, it was, this is like, early in the year. I was walking down, and I was like, oh yeah, love and love, love and love. Then this guy like, pulls over, and you know cat calls, we all know what they are, but this time, this cat call was not any ordinary cat call. Normally these cat calls are compliments. This time, it was a fucking like, insult, and it was like, whoa, okay, no one has ever said that since high school. And this guy like, Roll up, and he's just like, mmm. And like, he had like five people in the car, and he had this little fucking mullet, and he had his little bandana, and he had his tattoos, and he's like, oh, yeah. And he had loud music, and they're like, oh, yeah. And they're like, pull up, intersection, I'm crossing the road. Yeah, happy, happy. Imagine, just, I'm just trying to like, oh, yes, what are you, ooh, my shoes, what are you off right now, but imagine, if I'm wearing shoes, you're in them right now. So we're walking down, and I'm like, love, love. And then he's just like, ooh. Oh my god, this is so disgusting! Oh my god, this is so disgusting! <laughs> I was just like, far out. So I actually walk up to the guy, and you know what? We're gonna have to do a bit of role play. Uh, come over here. Come over here. Yes. Get it, get that stool as well. You, you're sorry to be the mean person. You're very nice. He's a very nice person in real life. He's a mean person in this scenario. So yeah, perfect. Now, get in your cup. Perfect. Okay, so. So he's like here, and I'm like here. And then walking down, and he's just like, oh, disgusting, disgusting. So I was just like, right, okay. Normally, cat callers, ladies, when someone's cat calling, just drive away, you can't do anything about it, right? No freaking conclusion. No, like, can't release this energy that I really want to scream at someone. You can't. So you just have to, and you just you can't do anything about it. So 
So what was really great about the situation, red light, red light, and then I could walk in and actually say something. But I tend to get into these experiences and not actually know what's going to happen next. Like I just go, oh, I'm going to do this. But I don't actually know. So it's just like, oh, let's just roll with it. Normally, if you're with your friends, you can have a laugh and all get on in it. But if you're alone, it's very confronting, five freaking guys in this car with music and telling you you're disgusting, not fair. But that's all right. I was like, you know what? Body image was like high priority in high school, so I totally worked on that. And I was like, tick that box. I want to deal with this. So, walked up to this guy, and I was just like, you can still hear me. And he was just like, oh, disgusting. And I was like, oh, what do you mean? Talking about my hairy legs. And he was just like, he literally just like, like didn't expect any, yeah, he did that. He didn't expect like any response because his cat calls are like, oh, I don't know what to say next. Because if you ever, ever have, ladies, if you ever have confronted a cat caller, they don't know what to say next after that. Like, what the bee? And you're like, what? And they're like, I don't know what to respond. I didn't expect to get to base two or whatever they call them. I don't know. So, and then he was just like, oh, it's, oh, it's so, oh, man, oh, like, oh, yeah, no, mm, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, what, what was with that? Like, calling someone disgusting, is that... Is that behaviour? Is that nice behaviour in society? Like, I was feeling pretty good about myself today, and then you just called me disgusting. And he was just like, oh, yeah. I was like, you know what, you should touch my hairy legs. So I put my <laughs> leg in his cup, because it was all winded down, winded down. I don't know what the, what the wow. word is, but wound down. It was wound down. So the car was winded down. Put my leg in there. It's fucking little lady you would tell you, know, like on street, tell you, like, oh my god, what is going on? Oh my god. And I was just like, oh, it's fine, it's fine, just keep going. Just You've already put your leg in the car. I'm not flexible, so it didn't last very long. <laughs> so I put it in the car, and then I was just like, touch it. And he was just like, and his friends were like, mm. literally that like constant pay there. And I was just like, uh, you need to touch it because if you feel your hairy legs and if you feel my hairy legs, they feel exactly the same. It's like you're touching your own legs. It's fine. It's normal. Why are we so afraid? And then his friend's like, oh yeah, don't worry, don't worry, girl, don't worry, girl. you're really hot, really hot, really sexy, it doesn't matter, I'm my friend just being a dick, yeah. I was like, mate, I don't care if you think I'm Beyonce, I don't care if you think I'm a sack of potatoes. It doesn't matter, because that's your fucking opinion, it does not matter. That's why I want every woman, every man, every fucking being in this world to be able to stand here with a million guys, all girls, lined up, and saying, you're not worth anything, you're disgusting, you're ugly, you're hideous, and still walk out of that experience going, you know what? That's your just that's just your opinion. That's not my opinion. And I think I'm hot. You know why I'm not it doesn't matter. I wish I knew that like 10 years ago, but that's alright. We all need progress. We need it. We all need to go through these experiences. So then back to the guy, and he was just like, oh, yeah, yeah. and he like, by then my leg had to come out because I wasn't you know, feeling it, because it's like, whoa. So I took it out, and he touched it, he ended up touching me, I was very proud of him. And then, um, and then, and then he goes, oh yeah, I, I mean, I, I just saw your face, and like, and I just thought, you know, you were a beautiful woman, and I looked down, and then you looked like a man, and I was just like, whoa. And I was just like, oh, okay. We don't have time, because it's gonna be a green soon to actually go into feminist theory, and actually like break down gender roles, but that's fine. Why don't we, why don't we just agree that you should apologise um, for your behaviour and the stuff that you said to me? Because imagine if I was a 15-year-old version of me. Imagine this was Sigjeet when she was 15 and she was depressed, she was suicidal, and then that one thing, and she didn't go to school because she was like, oh, everyone hates me because my hairy legs and everyone's bullying me. And imagine if that one little thing that that stranger said to her broke her and she went home and killed herself, how would you feel about that? How would you feel that your words don't have power but they also have power? So that's why it was really important. I don't know why I keep on staring at you. I'm really sorry, Dada. Just sorry. <laughs> sorry. Just, um, and then he was just oh. And he was like, obviously he got green by then because it's a very long speech. I talk a lot. And then got green and then he was just like about to drive away. And I was like, nah. So I stood in front of the car. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, no, drive me over, but you need to apologise, young lad. I am that little Nazi teacher in, you know, not, I'm not Trunchbull, I'm Miss Honey, but not even nice about it. I'm like Trunchbull and Honey mixed together. And he finally apologised, and I was like, justice is served. <laughs> I obviously 
was a cooler story, but that made it into a bit of a lane. But it was, it was, it was very epic. It felt really good. And then I walked away, and all these like people were just like, you know, it was intersections. So everyone's kind of just staring at you, and you, and then you'd be like crazy. Like, like, oh, you're the crazy bitch. Oh, you're the crazy. No, these men make me into crazy bitch. And it's not, it's not. And like, you know what it is? People go, oh, you know, how embarrassing. She's creating a scene in public. When mate, he fucking started, not you. He fucking started the scene. And yet, you know, oh yeah, we went to just be happy about it and just walk away. No, that was a very long-winded story for saying, that calls are not cool. And this poem, we're going to start now. Sometimes that talking is longer than the poetry, which is fine. Um, so, you can take your, oh, you can take, I don't know, you can take your work. You can have an up close, a spit a lot, so. Um, so, yes, so people, you know, in high school, they would say things like, oh, gorilla girl, whoa, here is like the world, man. I'd be like, Guinness World Book of Records, here I come. <laughs> and then they'll be like, you know, I'll be sitting on transport and in tram, and it's really intimate because you're hairy armpits around people's faces and you're holding shit. And, and then they're like, did you see that, bro? How hairy, hairy and feral is that chick? And you're like, mate, Mr. Speaker, before you categorise me in this referendum called my life, get to know me. You see, from age naught, I was taught six don't cut their hair. Till age nine, that was fine, but then it was hide that hair. Because your body, honey, is a questionnaire. I thought them white girls weren't born with leg hair. Why wasn't I the feminine displayed in ads, billboards, magazines? I saw models caress their Photoshop legs, exclaiming in voices sweeter than a lotus emerging from their uterus. Meet what pity feels like. What beauty feels like? Am I not a beautiful girl? Ew! That is so unhygienic! <laughs> we aren't living in the Stone Age, you know. Good luck getting a date with that bush! <laughs> but hey, girlfriend, what makes a woman? The hours we pretend to blend, the money we spend just to bend and snap for a passing trend? Mate! Welcome to the human body. Does nature disgust you? Do these hairs give you nightmares? It's not about whether we're fair or bare or have red hair or eat too many eclairs. It's in the movement, in the action, the way we flow. Beauty feels like standing up to those bullies in the schoolyard. Beauty is loving stretch marks, love handles and cellulite. Beauty is in the perfection and the imperfections. Beauty is fighting cancer, anorexia, suicide. Beauty doesn't judge, it doesn't hide. It's in the layers of a Sikh's turban, the folds of a Muslim's hijab. Beauty is brave, educated, free, like the ink on your arms may be your way to be you. The strands waving on my body are my beauty, my truth. The marks of birth, proof of life, maybe I am born with it. After all, a lioness is a lioness, not a kitten. And my mane will remain my hair. Thank you all. Um, <laughs> You're all going to um, hold some hold hands with each other. We're going to kumbaya the fuck out of this place. Um, you're going to hold hands, and the reason why is because a great sentence. Um, <laughs> because um, after Australia's Got Talent, I started getting a lot of. I told you about the hate, but there's also a lot of love, and I don't. I sometimes you actually don't know how to handle that much love when people are coming up to you and they're complimenting you and they're putting you on this very high pedestal and saying very big things like, oh, you're a Roma, you're an inspiration. And you're like, no, it's great. You know, you should definitely accept compliments and, you know, when someone's saying something to you, you should definitely take it and listen. But it's also really important, the stuff that I do and the stuff that I hope I, I'm doing is to actually ignite that in other people and be like, you know what? Yeah, it's great to compliment, but how are you going to take that step further? You know, a lot of the time, you go to human rights film festivals, we have so much ama amazing NGOs here, 
And it's great to like talk about it and you know do that little like and do that little click and be like, yeah, stay in the world. What does that actually look like though? And then young people, us, you know, we're all pretty young, and as young people, we sometimes like go, oh yeah, we want to save the world, we want to save the world. And then old people go, no, mm, oh, that's not practical, you're all idealistic, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, mm, okay, then what do I do? And I'll look at like, you know, United Nations like job applications and they have like job descriptions and like 40 years worth of like shit that you have to do. And you're like, oh my God, do I have to wait till I'm 40 to actually make it like a change in the world? And you're like, no, I don't have to wait till I'm 40. I actually can start right now. And all it takes, all it takes is that one more conversation and having a chat with your hater, having a chat with a bigot, in my case, having a chat with a freaking misogynist, and having a chat. <laughs> having a chat with people that we don't want to talk to. Because unfortunately, I didn't go on, you know, fortunately, I didn't go on Australia's Got Talent because I would be like sitting in an audition room with all those other chicks going, oh, I can't wait to be famous. I'll say anything, I'll say anything for TV. No, I fucking did it because sometimes these spaces are so great for me because they give me that ego boost and I feel like, yeah, but we are the converted. But actually out there is the not converted. And it's great. I feel like some pretty religious creature right now. Someone walked in right now, very awkward tiny, and they'll think I'll be like, mm. um, but the reason is on mainstream TV, um, it's it, a lot of people can say things like, oh, you're a sellout, why would you go on TV, why would you do that? But for me, it's really important to actually reach a wider audience um, that might have never heard of, like, uh, a Sikh, or, you know, that my dad called terrorists, like, every day. And, like, just shit like that that isn't fun to grow up in. And the Australia that... What is Australia? What does it mean to be Australian? So shit like that. Or even just hearing eggs on TV. Like, we haven't seen that. I've never seen that. Even beat ads don't show that. And they're meant to show before and after, but they don't. They just go, oh, yes, I'm shaving nothing. Because it's a thing there. Like, oh, that's practical. Be fucking practical. That's what it's about. Um, and also, you can disagree with everything I said right now. Hell yeah, definitely disagree. I'm just saying because i got the mic. And I'm going to use the mic. And I'm going to say whatever I want. But, oh, I'm so tired. That's why I'm, like, getting more and more honest. I've never said this shit. I'm so sorry if I'm offended anyone. The more on, it's like, I don't drink, um, but the people say that I, the more tired I get, the more drunk I look. So I was like, oh, okay, maybe I need to stop being like that um, and sleep. But um, the point of the story is, the reason why we're holding hands is because sometimes um, we forget that we can use our own two hands to make change. And it's not something that you need a million dollars for. It's not something that you need power and a massive status in your job. You can actually just use your own fucking two hands. But I'm really sorry people don't have two hands today. I didn't think about that. But I will put that in the next poem. Um, but um, so I want every single person, whether you like it or not, be, to be touching another human being in this room. And I also want you to close your eyes because um, closing eyes is really nice. And it's nice to fully experience this poem um, in, a, in a nice way. Great. Okay, so everyone close their eyes. Close their eyes, close their eyes, close their eyes. Yeah, close their eyes, perfect, done. You, you want to take photos, okay, that's fine. Um, <laughs> bar people, are you taking close your eyes? Or are you all working? Are you working? Close your eyes. Okay, you're still working, that's fine. Okay, you can work. You can, okay, uh, holding hands and work. Oh my God, amazing. They're just they're such a team, such a team. Mm, amazing, okay. And it has to hold hands, yes, hold hands, okay. And I'm going to be telling you to do things in this poem, but don't do them. The point is they're rhetorical, okay? Because people always, and this can be a test, because every audience have done this too, they fucking still do them. So just remember, the aim of the game is to keep holding hands with the person next to you, okay? Everyone can do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Hands up if you watch the news every night and can't decide on fight or flight or might is right. Hands up, everybody, and wave them in the air like you just fucking care. He told me, my bro, leave this earth better than at your birth when you go. So I look at these hands, two brown hands. One day I heard my mum say, my name's Sujit, it means winner of peace. So I thought I had to be a political feature, a spiritual preacher, anything but this hairy-legged creature. Then I saw the hands. My big sister said to me, hold my hand, bang baby, and look with me. When you gaze at this country, what do you see? Do you see stats or spirits, boundless plains or borders? When you gaze at the stars, do you see southern crosses or seven sisters? My hands had hope. 
So don't protect me from the world, Papa. My hands like yours are for working, Papa. Come build with me an empire of empathy. Friends, hold my hand and walk the streets with me. Do you see the superheroes? Every day, white, black and grey, curling and straight, giving their time of day, helping me on my way, laughing and having their say. Teaching their kids like, I'll teach mine to tend and mend and spend the time on another. Because a stranger is not always danger. So wave those hands, wave hello, shake those hands, shake them off, yo. Use those hands to touch, not type or like or emoji wink, you're all right. You'll feel the love and compassion no text can provide. Take a stand, hands, they're yours. I might be the wordsmith, Shalice might be the wordsmith. But with your applause, action this poetry and find your cause. Join this girl from Perth on a mission to leave this earth better than we found it at our birth. Thank you so much for having me. Enjoy. <laughs> Give our to some big please. Give our to some Fantastic, yeah. Absolutely amazing. Do we need a giraffe for now? Um, I actually need to get it organised. So okay, no, yeah. Let's yeah. no, not do the giraffe for now. Um, we're going to head on to the open mic. Thank you, Brendan. Um, please welcome on the open mic. Cat Lennon. Cat? No, 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 what? Cat face is not here. Cat face is in here. Lisa! Thank you, Sip Dick, for that amazing journey I just went on with you. <laughs> did you see my, did you see my butt? Oh, good. Okay. So Sip Dick was actually the one that encouraged me to come up today. So that is Woo! also beautiful. This is the I'm shitting myself. You're a goddess. <laughs> okay. Um. So it's just recently that I had the realization that I'm not white. I've been chasing whiteness my whole life, and then it suddenly dawned on me I don't want to be. But then who am I if I'm not you? I have moved too far away from where I started to return. And now I'm in no woman's land, neither here nor there. You see, I'm not like you, and you're not like me. Your dad didn't have to tape his knuckles and prepare himself for a battle against racism. And your uncle's idol is not Al Pacino. And your grandparents didn't have to work in factories their whole life to build this nation. And never get recognised. But nobody ever told me. I thought I had to be you because it was normal. And there were certainly no reflections of me anyway, nor of my family on the TV. So I was lost and confused and I wanted to be you without knowing I could just be me. But now things are changing. I am me. And I certainly don't want to be you. I won't mimic you. And I invite you not to mimic me. This one's a bit heavy, so sorry. It's in the fear of losing him that I find him. In the wild, raging fire, I find moisture. Losing myself was too familiar, but I stayed. Catching that tiny moment when his light, eyes lit up. I know this place, it's a known vulnerability. 
No need to travel to a foreign land, I'm already in it. A nest in an unknown territory. I can feel the winds are coming. So I sit under his shade until sitting becomes lying and lying becomes falling and falling becomes death. I catch myself, comforting myself. A part of him is in a part of me. And then when he goes, I can see that the jewel I was afraid to lose is lost already. A nurse to the wounded, preparing for the day that he will run free. And I'm the wounded one, broken, howling. But a part of you is in a part of me. Run free, my love, run free. And I will still love you because you are my soul. The rib cage entraps the heart that is wild, and my heart was ferocious for only him. A love so deep could not be located in my body. It transcended beyond a never-ending channel that could penetrate the Earth's core and travel beyond infinity into light. You move me, and you will remain like the two flames which burn and ignite, creating wounds that weep cradle me. It's a double-edged sword, joy and freedom, pain and suffering. I've tried to return back home, but when I return, that place is no longer a place I once knew. It's mayhem. And I can't even find a space to rebuild. There's no longer a set to sit in. No protection, no shade. But there's still a ground to lie down. So I rest my head, and here in the distance, a million miles away, those wings returning, Whispering, cradle me, my love, cradle me. Give it up for Lisa, please. Is that your first reading? Yes. That is fucking incredible. Give it up for Lisa again, please. Like I can only, I can only talk to myself. But like you know, eighteen months ago, I was where you are, like doing my first thing on the open mic, and just um, please keep coming back to here or anywhere else because it it fucking means so much uh, to share what you're going through with with other people, it really does. I'm sorry, again. All right, that was Lisa. Oh, God. Okay. Number nine on the open mic is... Chloe. 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 Oh, yes. Chloe on the open mic. Got the applause at the back. Keep it rolling. Keep it rolling. Oh, thanks, Chloe. Yeah. Hey, guys. Yay. I just want to say it doesn't make you a seller to go on TV. It's the content that counts. Ah. Absolutely. Woo! Thanks, Chloe. All right. Civilization is the manifestation of our fears of boundless uncertainty. The concrete streets don't care if you make it. The concrete doesn't care if you trip and fall over. It'll even scratch and bruise you. Repression is the beast that'll kill us all off. Only if we let it. Humanity is the salve that was there before the walls. Humanity is nature illuminated, animated. Nature will soothe your wounds through the endless valleys and mountains, cascading upon ever-shifting tectonics, which mimic the human mind. Scattered, shifting, unpredictable, constant movement, expanding, reverting, reacting, creating. To be lost in a world that demands that you sit still and whisper when you want to scream is to know that there is chaos around you because it is within you. Repression is the beast that will kill us all off, only if we let it. Each of us is a symphony orchestra charging through the concrete streets and high-rise buildings. Don't let fear become your conductor. Don't let another human disguised in a suit dictate your every motion, every thought, and every notion. Tis a sign of great valor to carry one's own. 
Draw that baton, change direction, alter the pace at any time. Follow the direction your soul is compelling you to take. You won't find yourself in a full wallet. I already checked there. <laughs> you won't find yourself underneath a uniform. I already tried that. And you won't find peace under someone else's doorstep. I already checked there too. <laughs> You'll only find stillness once you accept chaos. You'll only reach forgiveness once you embrace love. You'll only grow from understanding by observing, without expecting, attaching or judging whatever the thing before you may be. So don't go around building walls and cement footpaths, just in case. Just in case you change your mind. Oh. Give up the curly days. Ready to wrap them in? Ready to wrap them? Oh, we've only got one more on that. All right, okay. Please welcome. You all know him. He's the Grand Poobah. He is the, the creative genius behind NMSW. He is Benjamin Solar. Yeah. It's actually, believe it or not, my first time open micing on Girls on Key. Really? Yeah, which is shameful. Because you said I'm playing futsal on Wednesdays, but then it's like Girls on Key on Monday. I'm like, yes, I can tick this one off my box. I want to go to every single open mic in Melbourne. It'll happen. Um, so I got new shit. New shit. Yeah. This is from a, um, a free write last night at our workshop. And it's, the first line is from Nathan Kerno's new collection. We just like flips the book and picks a random line and the random line is he's converting the house into a submarine and then I wrote this he's converting the house into a submarine I'm serious he'll do it not just one house a whole block apartments by the dozen he as in some anonymous anonymous suit with a blank face his teeth covered in skin he defends himself Fist thump on the lectern, why you can't complain, there are, after all, more houses than submarines, plenty more. He'll cut costs on the demolition, a few unpaid interns marshalling people out of the drop zone. As the house tip, houses tip over, the doors are sealed off, a periscope out your kitchen window, and on the back of a truck, the houses they can't sell, whilst the homeless grow, shuffle down to the ocean. Better to smash houses, turn, turn submarines against the hulls of enemy, enemy boats than watch the prices drop, empty homes make no money. Oh, it won't be an election winner until Bill, sells, until Bill says he'll turn more houses into submarines. Hospitals and schools too. And it's a, and it's a ra race to the bottom after that. Little brain flats with torpedoes leave dead grass gaps in the city. Soon there's a run on submarines. No one knows how it happened. Got defense force magnates walking the street next to mine, picking out terraces to cut out the concrete and float it out to shore. Out past the heads, the cheap houses are the fodder, but eventually the mansions follow too. Hiding in the bay, the politicians periscope wait for the growing homeless to leave the beach. Thank you. Um, also new shit, but less new shit because I've done it a few times at open mics. Um, Ezra wanted me to do it, so I'm going to keep doing it. I mean, you could ask me, sure, it's a bit weird to be honest. The questions always seem like an accusation, like you don't really want to know. Like if you have to ask, it's not obvious, like I'm confusing you. Sorry, I'll wear a sign next time. There's a wiki in the back of my throat, I'll spit it at you. If I'm honest, every time you ask me, I'll give you a an different answer. Ask me if I'm straight, an hour later, I'll have changed my mind like Melbourne weather, it just comes all of a sudden sometimes. My mother can't quite work out bisexuality. She asked me when I told her, does that mean I'm breaking up with my girlfriend and I try to find a metaphor for it. Like I could ask it if I like both Chocolate and strawberry ice cream, does that mean I stop eating chocolate? But it doesn't work, because we're not talking about ice cream. A guy asked me once if I'm dating a woman, am I still queer? I asked myself that once, but I remember giving a guy a hand job on the dance floor. 
So I have witnesses. <laughs> Gave me a lifetime membership. That's how it works, right? Do I have to give it back? So then I decided to look up pansexuality in the dictionary. It seemed to fit. But I turned the wrong corner. I accidentally fell into an urban dictionary. And I got lost in someone's neck beard. And I didn't <laughs> like my eyeliner. He's still learning. Can't quite er can't quite work it out because we keep giving him different answers. Am I a man? Yeah, I guess so. Like most of the time, I am as I appear. Ask me tomorrow, though. I might be in, in a mood between the between the times of 12 and 12.15 where I kind of forget. People think I should be permanent. And when I change my mind, it will neatly be announced on Facebook that I feel a bit feminine today. Sure, it'll pass and then I'll be screaming like I want to be Bill Moran, kind of scramble up this poem and he'll love it. Why do you ask such stupid questions? Why do you want to know? Why do I feel like if I say how I feel, it'll probably be the wrong answer? I've seen your type. You twitch about as if me wearing rainbow football socks is going to out that thought you had for five seconds before someone slapped you on the back, gave you a beer, pointed to that woman across the bar and told you to go harass her until she likes you. That's how it all works, right? I picked it up a bit in high school. Sorry I didn't ask for more solid instructions. Now I go back home. The pubs are still there, the same training ground I refuse to partake in. If you take me as I appear, as I appear in that moment, it all turned out the same until you stalk me on Facebook, tag in photos where I've switched. I don't have to spell it out for you. You ask me who I am, and I can't give you a straight answer. But don't assume everything is impermanent. Like my mum thought I was bound to run away. Like if I change my mind, it won't be the same. If I have to spell it out for you, I'm in, I'm in love with her, not with her pronoun. That will never change. Give it up for Benjamin Salah, please. Fantastic. Two fantastic persons. We're going to draw the raffle now.